So we are here with Ken Mandit of Chicago's Damien Thorne. Um, Ken, um, when did Damien Thorne originally form? It was right around 1983. And were you in any other bands previously? Um, well, previously um, I was in a lot of different bands, but it was nothing very serious. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing really even worth mentioning. Uh, mostly just cover bands. Uh, Damien Thorne was uh, the first original project because uh, at the time I was 19 years old, teenager. Mm -hmm. Why did you settle on the name Damien Thorne? Well, um, we all sat around talking about trying to come up with a name and we didn't want to uh, have a name that was uh, that didn't have any real meaning behind it, and uh, you know a lot of bands would take uh, you know words like like you know exciter or invader or you know which is all great, but we wanted to have a name that had some kind of uh, solid representation behind it. So uh, Damien Thorne was an actual person's name, even mm -hmm. although a fictional character uh, from a movie, but it represented a, a person. Uh, so we felt that that was a little stronger, you know, it had personality behind it. Um, when the band form, um, what goals did you have in mind, uh, keeping in mind that you already played in previous bands, you kind of got a taste of being in a band. Um, what did you want to achieve once this band kind of got off the ground? Well, um, the goal was that uh, we wanted to form a band that was going to be um, a lifelong band. We didn't have any short-term goals with that band. Mm -hmm. Uh, we knew when we, when me and uh, Justin Fate put this band together, that uh, we didn't want a temporary band or a band that was just going to fall apart, you know, in a year or so. Um, the idea was that for longevity, and we had the commitment that we were going to do that. And uh, you know, not everybody lasted all that long. But uh, the bands, you know, we're celebrating our 35th year this year, so uh, I guess you could say we've got some longevity. True. Um, at the time, what was the Chicago scene like? It was great at the time. A lot of competition, lots mm -hmm. of bands, um, lots of places to play, um, and the clubs then... Um, when you went out to any club, any rock club, on a Friday, Saturday night, it was packed. And the bands playing there were quality bands. Um, unlike now where, you know, the, the venues don't have, a lot of the venues now don't have their own followings. They expect the band to bring everybody mm -hmm. on a Saturday night. Whereas back then it didn't, it didn't matter if no band was playing, these venues had crowds. You are absolutely correct. Yeah, so, that. Um, so that helped a lot. And then the fact that the bands on the scene at the time were great. There was a lot of talent. How would you describe the first recordings the band did, the demo recordings? Well, the demo, uh, you know, we didn't have any money, so... We found a, uh, a guy that owned a little studio and he was nice enough to let us come in and record some songs for cheap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we didn't have time to, you know, overdub and mix things. We, we basically went in, we set up our stuff, we put microphones in front of everything and, and we recorded and uh, what we played is what you got. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the image the band had, the visuals? I mean, you were a very visual band. It was, a, it was just more than a show back then. What would you say that was like? Well, you know, there was a lot of uh, 
the bands that that we really liked at the time were also very visual bands. Uh, like Merciful Fate was, I loved that band. And, uh, you know, King Diamond, had, you know, with the whole show. We were big into uh, older bands like Alice Cooper. Uh, also had a big show. We were Kiss fans, big show. Uh, you know, and then the heavier, the bands that, that we liked that were heavier at the time, you know, uh, you know, the classic, you know, Sabbath, Priest, Iron Maiden, um, they were all, we, one thing we noticed about all those bands is when it came to their live show, they were all pretty serious about it. And we knew that there was so much competition that we couldn't just, the music wasn't enough. You had to have some kind of show. Plus, we were young and full of energy, and you know, we didn't care what anybody thought about us. Uh, we just were enjoying what we were doing. You know. Um, so, what led to um, recording deal with Cobra Records at that time? Well, um, at the time. We weren't talking to any record labels, you know. We had uh, we wrote a lot of original songs. We scraped up money. We started to go into the studio. The idea was we were going to record our record and then figure out what to do with it, mm -hmm. you know. But while we were in that process of recording, um, we were playing somewhere. Uh, in Chicago, maybe like the Thirsty Whale or someplace like that. And uh, uh, Jack Starr, the guitar player from Virgin Steel, uh, I think he saw us and uh, he referred us to Cobra, which is the label that Virgin Steel was working with at the time. And uh, Cobra asked to hear some stuff, and we gave them some stuff, and they loved it. Um, and you know, they made us an offer, and it was it was the only serious offer that we, you know, that we had at the time, and it sounded good, so we went with it. And back then, being signed was really a big deal. I mean, nowadays, it was a huge deal, bands yeah. don't even do demos; they do records. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas back then, getting a record deal was something huge. Well, oh yeah, because we weren't even thinking of yeah. that really, you know. We were, you know, we made our demo and we sold that on our own, you know, through mail order and magazine ad advertisement. And we really envisioned doing the same thing with the record. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as our demo, like, got to Europe, we got a lot of uh, letters from European labels. Um, offering us stuff, but we didn't really look at that very seriously because, you know, we fi figured, you know, they're in Europe and yeah. we're here. How are we going to have a good, uh, you know, situation? So uh, uh, when Cobra came, we went with it, mm -hmm. you know. So as a result of that record deal, um, the sign of the Jekyll um, came out. You want to show the album? and. Uh, try to tell us uh, anything that we. Sign as Jackal. Yes. Uh, what do you remember from recording that album? Uh, who produced it, and, and how did the album do overall? Um, well, the initial because we started recording the record before we got uh, involved with Cobra. Mm -hmm. um, at first, we were just producing what we were doing ourselves. Um, after we. Uh, Cobra got involved, um, uh, then Dave DeFay, the singer from Virgin Steel, he was producing a lot of uh, albums for Cobra, and um, he really liked this, you know, what we were doing, and uh, he brought us out to New York, and uh, you know, he finished producing the record. We mixed everything there. And along with a, a guy, uh, Dave uh, Uba, who uh, also did like Kill 'Em All, Metallica, and some other stuff. 
How did the album do once it came out? Uh, in the United States, terrible. Mm -hmm. In Europe, it seemed to be doing great. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, uh, Roadrunner Records picked it up from Cobra, licensed it from Cobra. Uh, Cobra was going to release the album in the United States, and uh, A&M Records released it in Canada, and then uh, Roadrunner took care of all the other territories of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in the U.S., uh, it got very little attention. Mm -hmm. You know, there, we were just another underground band trying to copy Metallica, they would say, you know. Uh, but in Europe, it was great. Um, did you do any promotion, like touring, for that album? We did, mm -hmm. in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> we did a lot of shows, and uh, it didn't seem to help. You know, I mean, it was good experience uh, for us. Uh, you know, we got to play a, a lot of shows that, with some other bands that we liked, and uh, it was good experience, but it did really nothing for our record sales. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, things didn't really work out with Cobra. Yeah, which brings me to my next question. You were in the middle of your um, second album recordings when you parted company. What happened? Well, um, they, we found out that uh, we were, not only was our, our record wasn't selling great, uh, but what, what was selling, they were not reporting to us. Um, and then we actually found out through somebody at Roadrunner, because um, they had the real numbers of what was happening in the in the U.S. Um, and you know we found out that they were just kind of ripping us off. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know so we got uh, lawyers involved, and then uh, Cobra pretty much pulled the money out that we were going to use for the second record. Um, so uh, that was it then with Cobra. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had no money then to do the second record. So we actually, we went in the studio again uh, with favors from studio guys that, that we knew and uh, that second record which is called Wrath of Darkness yes actually, it came out a little bit later yeah it actually didn't get released until much much later mm -hmm. this record but we recorded this it wasn't even a year after we recorded Sign with Jackal uh, Sign with Jackal we recorded in 85 uh, and it came out in 86. I think uh, Wrath of Darkness we recorded uh, in 86. We were going to re release it in 87, but then it all fell apart. Then. But um, we basically had a budget of $200 to record a record. And, oh boy. Uh, yeah. So we made a deal with a guy, a friend. The guy that owned the studio actually was one of my guitar instructors when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, and he kind of had a soft spot for us, you know, and always tried to help. And uh, I told him, he said, I said, we have to, uh, we got nine songs we need to record. He said, how much money you got? And I said, we have 200 bucks. And he's like, well, he goes, all I could do for you is I could give you two hours of time and, um, but you couldn't use all the equipment. So we had to record on a, a two track machine instead of the 24 track machine. Mm -hmm. So basically we set up live in the studio and all the instruments were mixed down to one track and then the vocal and the lead guitar was on track two. Wow. And um, we had two hours to to just start playing. You know, we couldn't overdub anything. Um, 
So we ran through the nine songs basically in one take, and that was it. Then the second hour, we put all the vocal tracks down, and that was it. We were done. Wow. Now, around the same time you uh, left Chicago for Los Angeles, uh, why did you do that? Well, because at the time, that's where all the music, uh, that was the hub of the music world as far as record labels and the scene in LA was was booming it was booming yeah and all the record labels were there and um, you know we needed a new label and we needed to kick start st things uh, so we thought that it would be a great idea to go there and uh, we thought that that would be the answer to our problems was to go out there uh, but unfortunately, it, it didn't work that way. We got out there, and um, uh, we didn't realize that L.A., compared to Chicago, L.A. was a pay-to-play town. Yeah. Where Chicago was not. You know, a band... Not at the time. Not at the time. <laughs> yeah, a band could play a show in Chicago and get paid. And you know, have a nice crowd and the, the, the club would pay you. There, you, you're paying them for the opportunity to be in front of their crowds. And, you know, we couldn't, we had no jobs, we had nothing, you know, and uh, we couldn't do it. You know, we, we, were, we were able to do like a show maybe once every three months someplace, and then we would be lost in the bill. There'd be eight bands and we'd be like number three and you know by the time we finished playing nobody even showed up yet you know uh, and the music style there was turning Very you know nice it, it was like 1989 now and uh, you know the grunge thing was starting to become popular and there was LA was full of a lot of bands like Motley Crue and Poison and we didn't fit no you know we didn't fit musically image wise no. Miles apart. Yeah, miles apart. So, uh... Now, eventually, I think this also led to the band stopping, stop being a band, right? Well, we never broke up, but we did go on hiatus. Mm -hmm. um, and we had some problems. Some members leaving um, for various reasons, some members dying. Um, you know, this band's had three people pass away, unfortunately. Um, so, so yeah, we all moved. We moved back to Chicago one at a time. Slowly, everybody migrated back to Chicago, and um, me and Justin, you know, wanted to continue what we were doing. Uh, so. Um, we, we started bringing new people into the band, and uh, we stayed together, And but we, did, we didn't, uh, we went probably like eight years where we didn't do a show. Yeah. Uh, but every week we were still rehearsing and uh, writing songs, and, you know, we're, we had a lot of bad luck, you know, with the people... Um, dying, you know, tragic things happening in the band, um, you know, uh, you know, Mike, when Mike, our other guitar player, passed away, he was, he was only 23 years old, you know, um, we replaced him with Matt Hauser, he passed away, he was, I think he was 29, you know, um, and then uh, a few years back, Sanders Pate passed away. Um, and really, you know, the soul of that band was me and Sanders and Justin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, me and Sanders wrote, you know, all that music together, and Justin wrote all the lyrics and um, helped with the, uh, arrangements and musical parts you know the three of us were that soul and I think um, 
once we lost Sanders, uh, that kind of killed a lot of a lot of things, you know. Now uh, you resurfaced with an EP, uh, which is right there, former life, former life. Yes. Uh, and, and I think people got a, a a taste that the band is truly back or back to life, uh, even though you it, you never broke up. Uh, how do people respond to that EP? Uh, very well, actually. Mm -hmm. um, when when we did this, see, when um, in the '90s we you know we took that little break where it was just kind of me and Justin and some random uh, guys playing, um, and then we decided we got uh, Tom. Creasel, our, our drummer, Tom was in the band. See, a lot of people don't know the the timeline correctly. Um, when Sign of the Jackal came out, that was me and Justin and Sanders Pate, um, and the the guy that played drums on Sign of the Jackal was Brian Horak. Mm -hmm. Now, on the album cover, it's me, Justin. Sanders, and then it shows Pete Magonis and Michael. Um, they joined the band while we were in the process of finishing that record. So we put their face on the record, but they didn't play on the record. It was, you know, uh, me and Sanders and Brian Horak. Um, but prior to Sign of the Jackal, mm -hmm. Um, the very first lineup of the band had Tom Creasel playing drums um, and uh, Rick Browse, who's in the band now, uh, on bass. So uh, that's why uh, later, after we took our break for all those years, it was like late nine, maybe like 1997. Yeah, late 90s. Something like that. Um, we wanted to get serious again about, you know, we decided that, okay, we're going to start playing again live. Um, and, you know, we're a, kind, we're a band that, that we like to stay within, mm -hmm. you know. I didn't like outside people coming into the band because uh, they didn't really understand what we were trying to do and they were always trying to change what we were trying to do and you know me and Justin and uh, you know we had a vision kind of what we wanted this band to be um, and I knew that Tom Creasel and, and Rick were part of that early vision so uh, we asked them to come back to the band and they did and uh, that's when we did uh, For, For My Life. life. Um, now, your next release does not include Justin. Uh, what happened? Well, um, after Formal Life, mm -hmm. and we started playing out again, we, um, we did some festivals, um, and uh, started playing again, and I think it was just too much for Justin, you know? Um, after so many years of just like uh, struggling and nothing happening and and you know him just being kind of disappointed in it in could take what, a toll you know it takes a toll yeah. and I think when we started playing live again I think he had big expectations but I don't think that uh, maybe it was going the way he wanted it to, or maybe he was just tired, but one day he was like, you know what, I, I, I think I need to be done. Uh, so he left. Mm -hmm. Are you still on friendly basis? Uh, yeah, I don't talk to him that much, uh, but yeah, there's no problems. And that's great. Uh, that's great. He's a very, Justin's a very private person, um, and you know, he kind of keeps to himself, and so, you know, I don't get to really talk to him like I would like to, uh, but yeah, we have no issues, you know. He, 
just it just took a toll on him, you know. So the next album, Haunted Mind, if you want to show it, that one included a new singer. Yes, Haunted Mind. Um, how did you go about rebuilding the band at this point? Well, so now Haunted Mind, we had, uh, uh, you know, Rick, Rick and uh, Tom Creasel mm -hmm. were in the band, and uh, Joe Martin. Now it became Tom's turn to kind of be done with things. Mm -hmm. You know, he started to. Uh, uh, I think uh, there might have been a little bit of bad blood between, you know, Justin and, and Tom with Justin leaving and all this stuff, and, you know, Tom decided he also wanted to go, so uh, Mike joined, you know, Mike is Rick's brother, you know, Rick and Mike are brothers, and Mike has been in the circle for the entire time you know, since the big, very beginning, and it just made sense, you know, he's a great drummer, and, uh, you know, he's with us every day, so it just made sense that Mike would become part of the band, and, uh, you know, again, you know, we like to keep things in-house, you know, we try to keep, you know, outside influences out that could hurt us, uh, but unfortunately now, you know, with Justin leaving, we had to have a, a new vocalist. True. And um, the guy who sings on this record is Joe Martin. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe's a great singer. Um, he's a local Chicago guy. Uh, he's played in a lot of different bands. Um, most notably, uh, a lot of Judas Priest cover bands, because that's his, what he really likes. And, and, you know, I didn't know how it was going to go with Joe at first because it's a, you know, I liked Joe. I knew him from, you know, uh, an acquaintance. But he was a new person coming in, and uh, I wasn't sure how, how it was going to work because it's always been me and Justin the whole time. Sure. And Justin was, you know, the sound of that band, you know, in the early days. But we brought Joe in and uh, everybody hit it off, and uh, <clears throat> Joe sounded great. And uh, unfortunately it was short-lived. We recorded uh, Haunted Mind, which really I think is one of my favorite records that we've ever done. Um, it, I think it's very underrated. Um, but Joe did a great job, and he, you know he's not Justin. He doesn't sound like Justin, but he's got his own thing. He's got his own style, and uh, we went out. I think we went on one European trip with him. Uh, we were headlining at uh, Headbangers Open Air in Germany, and um, unfortunately, that was Joe's last gig with mm -hmm. the band. <laughs> Uh, you know, Joe, Joe has his own personal demons, you know, oh, yeah. so uh, unfortunately he couldn't really Come dedicate back. enough to what we wanted to do. Um, you know, he had his own personal life stuff that he needed to deal with, um, so we had to part ways. But, you know, Joe's a great friend, and uh, um, I see Joe a lot, and, you know, uh, we love Joe. But it didn't stop there. You went on, found another yeah. singer, and did another record. Do you want to introduce it? We did another record. Um, <clears throat> this was End of the Game. Mm -hmm. Now, this album had a lot of difficulty. And um, I think there are some good moments on this album, but uh, I still have kind of a bad taste in my mouth from this record. Mm -hmm. It was a long and tedious project, and um, the singer on here is uh, Martin de Bourget. Um, 
I don't remember how we found Martin, um, but uh, Martin's a guy with a great voice, a very unique voice. Um, but our personalities really, his personality and the band's personality didn't really mesh very well. And uh, this album, there was just a lot of bad things happened during the, the recording of this, which stretched it out over like two years, I think it was, of working on this record and things going wrong and um, just a lot of, I mean, even not centered around the record itself, but in everybody's life, there was bad things happening, and it was just a, a struggle. And I think musically it took a toll on, on us too, all these things that were happening. And um, so, like I said, uh, we didn't really have enough time, I think, to gel with Martin. We rushed him in the studio and kind of rushed to get that record out. And like I said, there's some... I think there's some good moments on there, but as an album, um, it's not my favorite, even though it's my own. <laughs> well, but, you're being honest. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not bad, but I don't think it's, I don't think it represents what I en envisioned this record to be. And then, uh, you know, we did some shows, and I think that lack of chemistry came out in those shows. Um, we played at uh, Keep It True, I think that was 2011 maybe, and uh, I was really looking forward to that show. And I just don't, I think we had a, I don't think we played poorly, but I, I don't think the chemistry was there on that particular day. Uh, so again, kind of everything associated with this record is for me, kind of a, you know, bummer. bad chapter. Bad chapter. Yeah. Okay. Well, locally, you were able one to more. recover <laughs> with one more singer and one more record. <laughs> one more, yeah, well, that seems to be the thing—a new, new singer. Kind of like record, a spinal right? tap moment, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, this is Soul Stealer. This is our latest record. This one, I'm very proud of. I love this record. See, it's fun. You go from the bad low to a Great high. Yeah, I think this is a great record. Um, Warren Halverson is, sings on this record, and uh, Warren is still in the band today. Um, we've had a lot of success with Warren. Um, again, he's another Chicago area vocalist, a lot of successful bands. Um, but we have chemistry. Um, both right you know, as far as songwriting goes, you know, he works really well with me and Rick and Mike and, um, you know, and we also have Brian at the band now. You know, we've had uh, bad luck with second guitar players, so we decided, why, why not try a keyboard player? So now we have a keyboard player and a new singer on this record. Um, and, you know, Brian's a guy that we've known for a long time and Warren and you know we're like the chemistry is great and we're like family and things are like for the first time in decades the band to me feels like the, the band again, right um, but this record's a little you know we have different personalities now you know uh, Warren is not Justin you know uh, and we have keyboard influence in, in the band now instead of, you know, the double guitar thing. Um, so naturally our writing style, uh, different influences come out now. Uh, you know, we've always been very big into like, you know, Deep Purple, uh, bands like that, uh, Dio, you know, uh, rainbow so I think now we have a little bit of that influence in the band and I think it works 
-hmm. You know, we, we took a lot of crap from people, said, oh, you know, they're not the same band now, you know, uh, and they have keyboards, so, you know, but... It's all but about the change. You have to change. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm 53 years old right now. When I made this record, I was 19 years old. You know, there was a big difference um, in personality-wise. Mental state, mental how you approach state. music. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, you know, how I play my instrument, you know, the writing styles. And even though the influences are still pretty much the same, you know, when I was 19, I listened to, you know, everything from Slayer and Merciful Fate, Judas Priest, to Rainbow and Deep Purple and, and things like that. And it's still the same influences, but the approach is different now, you know. And I think, you know, we always wanted to have an identity and sound like, we always wanted people to hear a song and say, yeah, that sounds like Damien Thorne. But we didn't want everything that we did to all sound the same. You know, I didn't want to make five records that are all continuations of Sign of the Jackal. You know, I wanted every album to have its own identity. And unfortunately, um, everything we do gets compared to Sign of the Jackal, mm -hmm. you know? Like a point of reference? Yeah, and, and, you know, it's like, well, you know, the albums must be bad because it doesn't sound like this one, but that's not the case. It's just different. You know, and it, if, like, the some people criticize this CD um, because it has keyboards or, or something, um, you know, and they'll compare it to Sign of the Jackal, but if you, I think if those same per people heard this and never knew what this was, they'd be like, oh, this is great. But because they know us as this, mm -hmm. now uh, this is like forbidden. We're not supposed to be this. We're supposed to be this, if that makes sense. It does. It does. You know? Um, will there be more? There is. Um, <laughs> right now, uh, we started writing... We have a couple of songs um, already uh, in pre-production for a new record. Uh, we've recorded some demos of, of some things. Um, next week we're going, we're leaving for uh, Italy. We got some shows there, um, and then when we come back from that trip, then we're going to start recording, and hopefully we'll have a record done in the spring. Um, also, um, Sign of the Jackal, uh, we're going to re-release this. Um, uh, Bart Gabriel, you know Bart Gabriel? Yes, I know. Yes. Um, Bart is going to remaster this and uh, put this out uh, sometime early next year as well. So. Because a lot of people have been asking for Sign of the Jackal, and um, we did one re-release of it like 10 years ago, um, and it sold out pretty quick. So uh, people are still asking for it, so we're going to re-release it. Maybe put some bonus material on there as, as well. Uh, and uh, hopefully, I still want to. We still haven't released the vinyl of Soul Stealer. So I'm going to try to do that this coming year as well. So hopefully we'll have three, three things come to life in uh, 2019. Finally, 35 years of Damien Thorne. Was it all worth it? Absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, if it wasn't worth it, I wouldn't be doing it. You know, and you know. We're not a famous band. We don't make any money. You know, we don't have, uh, we don't get the attention that some bands get, but nobody wants to. You know, all we ever really wanted to do is make some great songs, you know, and uh, play our instruments. And 
and we're still doing it. So it's a wonderful thing. You know, I've got a uh, great family, I've got great friends, you know, I've got, uh, you know, my band is my second family. And to me, it's all worth it. I mean, 35 years later, and we're still, you know, we're not rich or famous or anything, but I still get to travel. We go all over the world and meet awesome people, you know, and, uh, you know, that's another great thing is, you know, when we go out and play, like if I go play a festival in Athens, Greece, uh, and then the next year I go play a festival in uh, Denmark, the same people are there. I see people that I, I, you know, I was like, hey, you know, I met you last year in Athens. And, and everybody knows everybody, and, and it's fun. And, you know, I think that whole scene in, in Europe, the, the festival circuit, keeps this whole thing alive. And those guys that promote those festivals deserve a lot of credit. Thank you. Thank you.